Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to you all and thanks for joining us for this launch event for our climate strategy and our natural environment plan consultations. My name is David Perrett and I'm communications business partner here at Wiltshire Council. Apologies um, for the delay in starting the event. Um, we have had a couple of technical glitches this evening. Um, we're joined today by um, Richard Councillor Richard Clure, leader of Wiltshire Council, Councillor Nick Bottrell, cabinet member for climate change and Councillor Tamara Ray, portfolio holder for climate change. Unfortunately, we have had a few technical issues getting Claire O'Neill to join the event. We are hoping we can get these resolved quickly and she will join shortly. Um, just to note that our speakers today won't be going through the two strategies. Um, to find out more about them, please join us at one of our webinars on the 15th or the 30th of September. You can sign up to these on our website. Before we start, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to how and then we'll get straight on with the session. If you wish to see closed captions of speakers' words, then please click on the CC button on the bottom right of the screen, and they should then appear after 30 seconds or so. The system sometimes takes a little while to get warmed up. If you're having any technical problems, the most common solution is to switch it off and switch it on again. So please close Teams or your browser, reopen it, and click on the meeting link again that was sent through earlier. Other problems may be down to your home internet connection. If you're hearing an echo, it may be that you have this event open in two or more windows. You're welcome to submit a question to be answered using the chat function, and please also leave your name. Our presenters and colleagues will answer as many as they're able to, and will provide written answers to questions that we're not able to get to, and we'll publish those on our website. Many of you also submitted questions before the event, and we will aim to answer as many of those that we can today too. You should be able to see the slides on your screen, and over on the other side, you should be able to see the Q&A panel. For some of you, it may be beneath your screen and you'll need to scroll down to see it. You may need to click on the icon of two overlapping speech bubbles to open this panel. We will use this panel to make any announcement. Please note that this event is being recorded and we will be published on YouTube later, but only this, this evening's speakers will be shown on the screen. I'll now hand you over to Councillor Richard Clure, Leader of Wiltshire Council, who will take you through our journey and how we've got to where we are now. Yes, thank you, David. Good evening. Um, we have been on a, 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 an interesting path uh, a, a, as a council looking to address climate change since um, the motion was passed at full council in 2019 um, and the, the creation of, of both the, the scrutiny group that followed that and also the other, the other elements of the strategies that we've been, been putting in place. Um, I also think it's fair to say that, that uh, nationally and globally um, things have been moving apace and I think we're at a tipping point now. We're at a point where as a country and as a county, we need to move from looking at what needs to be done and thinking about what the problems are and how they can be resolved to actually starting to resolve them. Uh, that's very much the national picture as I see it. Uh, I was, um, I, I, as well as um, being leader of Watch Council, I also um, chair the Countryside Climate Network, which is a subset of, of UK 100, um, which is a, a series of uh, rural authorities looking at how we can deal with climate change and, and the specific issues we're facing. UK 100 is a broader uh, body uh, comprising um, authorities across the UK, uh, both rural and urban. Um, and, and talking to everyone, it's very clear that, that this is the point at which we need to go from saying we need to retrofit all our housing to working out the plans to retrofit them. Now, a lot of that is going to take government uh, assistance, changes to national policy, um, and government are in the process in, in, in this COP year of pulling those, those policies together. They've started publishing them. We've already had the, the transport decarbonisation plans coming out, uh, and there are lots, lots more policies to follow. But if we're going to create inside Wiltshire the structures to enable us to take that government policy and turn it into deliverability inside Wiltshire, we need to have our own strategy. <coughs> uh, we need to understand the areas that we're going to address. We need to understand the scale of the problem. And on that, we can then build the delivery plans to resolve those problems, to, to meet that change uh, as we get the, 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 the details of, of the specific details of government policy as well. Now, we're already doing everything we can as a local authority. Um, we have committed to make ourselves carbon neutral by 2030. Um, we've reduced our emissions by 80% since 2015. 
Um, we're also looking at what we can do as a, a, a leader inside wheelchair to generate the industries that we're going to need to address this moving forward. Um, but as I've said, there are a lot of parts of the picture that still need to be put together, dealing with the public, dealing with business, um, dealing with grid infrastructure. And to do that, we need the strategies um, that we're looking at today. And, and we need to remember that we're, this isn't something we can look at in isolation. It needs to be looked at as a combination of both how we are approaching um, a carbon reduction, but also how we are approaching the environmental issues that go hand in hand with it and preserving our environment. Uh, we have an awful lot of extremely attractive, extremely beneficial environment in wheelchair, and it's critical that we preserve and enhance that as we move forward as well. Um, I think I'm meant to be handing over at this point to Nick Bottrell, cabinet member, although I've just seen an ominous sign of, of his uh, face disappearing with a sign saying leaving. Um, uh, if Nick isn't here, I'm going to have to be throwing Tamara into the deep end to explain the strategy, who's the portfolio holder um, for, for climate change. So I'm going to hand over now to, to either Tamara or Nick, depending on, on whether Nick has been able to rejoin the call or not. I'm just going to give Nick a moment or two to rejoin. I'm very sorry, everyone, for the technical issues that I'm sure Nick is facing at home as well. OK, well, while we wait to for Nick to join, um, to rejoin, um, shall I ask some of the pre-submitted questions that, that uh, we were asked? Yep, that's a good idea, David. OK, um, so um, the first one um, is for Richard and it's how will Wiltshire Council help homeowners understand options for replacing domestic heating systems and improving energy efficiency? Thank you. Sorry about the technical issues we're having here. Um, we will try and resume the schedule as we were meant to run it as soon as we can. Um, that is a really, really complex, uh, complex question. Um, at the moment, if you want to retrofit a property in wheelchair, it's extremely difficult, uh, not because we don't know what to do, but because of the availability of people who are able to, to, to do that and to provide that assistance. Um, we are already doing everything we can with our own council housing. Um, we have a program there to retrofit all of our um, council housing properties to EPCB. And one of the reasons we're driving that now is to make sure that we use that to build the um, industry, the, 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 the base of people who have those skills to then enable a wider um, a wider spread of, of residents, housing associations, private landlords to be able to retrofit as well. Um, this year, government's very much focusing on, on assisting low income residents. So um, we've got the, a, a brand new scheme launching soon that will give any household with an income of £30,000 or less um, living in a property that's rated D, E, F or G um, for energy efficiency, the chance to access up to £10,000 for things like insulation, insulation, solar panels, double glazing and new front doors. And that is an amount of money that can have a significant difference, make a significant difference to the energy efficiency of a property. Um, but we're going to have to build on that as we move forward. It, it's going to take time to see the, uh, the the country and wheelchair scale up to deliver it. Thank you, Richard. Um, so the next question is for Tamara. Um, could the council support residents to install solar panels and reduce the need for fossil fuels? Uh, absolutely. This is something that we're investigating for uh, Wiltshire. As I'm sure um, people know, other local authorities, including our neighbours at Baines, are offering discounts on solar panels uh, through bulk buying schemes. Um, we are looking at this and um, we would hope to launch a scheme um, as soon as possible um, early next year. Um, I should also say that uh, Nick has messaged me to say that he um, things are not going well for him from a technical perspective. Um, so I think that perhaps I should do the introduction to the uh, strategies um, and then we'll come back to um, the questions and, and everything else. But uh, David, I'm also seeing a number of points in the chat around uh, individuals who are with us today in the audience who are having problems. So can we just confirm that's not a global issue? and that other people that there are uh, people who are able to um, hear and see etc I, I believe some people have had um, technical issues but but in the main 
um, most people can um, see and hear, hear the webinar. OK, great. Well, um, I will um, try to stand in for Nick um, if that's OK. Um, so um, uh, as we as you as you those who are with us will know, uh, Nick Bottrell, cabinet member for climate change, um, has um, technology is not working well for him tonight. And um, I uh, support Nick as portfolio holder um, for climate change. Um, you uh, the fact that the council um, uh, under Richard's leadership um, has created the posts of um, cabinet member and uh, uh, climate change. Um, demonstrates just how the importance with which uh, we we give this uh, the, this agenda um, in within within Wiltshire Council. This isn't just about achieving carbon neutrality for Wiltshire Council by 2030. The council, important as a an organisation in in all of our lives, I'm sure across Wiltshire, is responsible for a relatively small percentage of carbon emissions across the county. This is about using the governing and convening powers and the democratic mandate of the authority to inf influence the direction of travel over a whole area with regard to carbon emissions. Governments can make laws and decree dates for achieving milestones, but it will be the areas like ours and the changes that we can bring into play um, that will be informed by the strategy, which will uh, turn these into a reality um, for our lives and for future generations. As I'm sure you uh, will have um, uh, picked up from the uh, the um, the consultation material that has been um, posted published on the internet, we actually have two strategies on uh, that we are consulting on, and uh, much work has um, gone into those. And I'd like to thank the officers um, of Wiltshire Council who have worked so hard on that. Uh, we have the climate strategy and uh, the, what we call the blue and green infrastructure strategy, but they are, as the label says, very much strategies. They're not uh, detailed delivery plans. The climate strategy, as Richard has outlined, has been arrived after much validation along the way. Uh, the strategy sets out on seven key areas. Um, the first one being transport as a considerable considerable contributor to emissions and decarbonisations, which will require a multifaceted approach, especially in our rural county, uh, where many of us are reliant on the private car in order to access our, our towns um, and to get around. Um, homes and the built environment. Uh, so that's about obviously getting uh, carbon neutral new development as well as ret retrofitting existing ones. And again, we have many challenges um, in the county given the um, uh, that much of much of us are um, off the gas grid um, and that we have many um, listed and period properties and conservation areas, etc. So challenges there. Um, natural environment, food and farming, uh, food production produces a fifth of all carbon emissions. And obviously, you know, where we are, we have many farms. It also the, this covers energy and the green economy, um, um, you know, which provides many, many opportunities um, to um, create jobs in that area uh, in the county. We have there's more to do on waste um, and to use our re recycling technology um, and, you know, and also very much the focus on achieving a carbon neutral um, council. The notion of the climate strategy is is probably well understood, but you know many people probably are sort of wondering what the green and blue infrastructure strategy is about. As a council covering over 1,200 square miles, we have large areas of parks, open spaces, woodlands, trees, and many many gar uh, trees and gardens, etc. All examples of green inf green infrastructure which provides environmental and wider benefits. Our blue infrastructure, by contrast, comprises the lakes, ponds, canals and watercourses. And one way or another, a large part of our area comprises uh, many green and blue infrastructure sites, including the six main river catchment areas and much of it within the designated um, AOMBs. The green and blue infrastructure strategy sets out the council's vision for how we manage, protect and enhance biodiversity, ensures access for our residents to the green and blue assets, as well as uh, the well-being benefit of, of being out in the uh, open space. 
and, and works with the process of nature to adapt to climate change. Climate change has considerable potential to impact adversely on green and blue infrastructure, and this second strategy should therefore not be seen as a standalone to the climate change one, but rather as a wholly complementary piece. The two are inextricably linked and intertwined, and we would like you to consider both in that light. Um, so I've sort of stood in for Nick there. I still don't think he's back. Um, uh, no problem. Thanks, Tamara. Um, We'll take some more questions if that's OK, and I've, I've seen um, that several have been coming in in the chat and um, as, as I said before, those are being um, provided with written answers from our officers in the climate team. So if we just um, go back through the pre submitted questions. Um, so this one is for Richard and it's how will the council positively positively engage with agricultural business to partner on climate projects? support business improvements and enable farm businesses to maximise food, environment and climate production on their land. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's important first to, to recognise that um, dealing with, with agriculture is primarily something uh, where, where central government has the leading role. Um, so the, I think there are there are some limits there as to how much the council uh, can and ought to be involved. But I think um, we are a large landowner inside the county. We have a, a, a lot of county farm tenants, um, so we can certainly engage with them. I think we have to understand both the pressures that farmers are under with the the transition to a to a new model of subsidy, um, but also then the benefits that come with that, and particularly the benefits that come in around the delivery of of natural improvement and and the the greater emphasis on nature and biodiversity. So I think we need to work with them. We need to understand what they're doing, but I think we need to be supportive. It's it's a very much supportive role that we will need to to follow there. Thank you very much, Richard, and um, I'm pleased to say that um, Nick has been able to rejoin us. Um, so. I will ask Nick the next question, if that's OK, so um, it's what strategies will you have in place to improve habitat connectivity? Hi, well, look, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Um, literally with about two minutes to go before I was due to speak, the whole system seemed to crash uh, and there was no internet availability. I suspect something might have prompted it. Maybe there was some sort of uh, event uh, on TV or something that led to a lot of downloading. Download anyway, but there we go, I'm back. Um, thank you for that question um, about habitat connectivity. And the Green Blue Infrastructure Strategy, uh, that which is our natu natural environment plan, provides a very high level of strategic vision um, for how the future uh, as to uh, integrating biodiversity with development in Wiltshire will work over the coming decades. Um, the detail of habitat interconnectivity will be developed in, in the um, local, um, Wiltshire's local nature recovery strategy and the settlement frameworks um, which will be based on the vision, goals and principles set out in, in this strategy here. Um, so both these documents are already being developed and we're going to continue to shape them over um, the next 18 months. Thank you, Nick. Um, and the next question is for Richard. Um, will contractors be held to similar standards in tender criteria across all areas, for example, waste, children's services and schools? And if not, why not? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, our strategic procurement team is is at the moment trying to ensure that social value considerations are are incorporated into procurement as far as national rules allow, um, such as including questions on carbon emissions in tender processes, setting up contracts to include performance indicators, tracking emissions, and so on. Um, social value. It also needs to include broader social, environmental, economic considerations. We've got to make sure money is being spent both for the public good, um, uh, uh, but also uh, uh, I come back to the point, it's got to be in line with the, the regulations we have to follow as well. The climate team, it, it, they've been involved in a number of contracts coming up for renewal over the past year, uh, and, and they'll continue to, to work to make sure it is embedded into um, the way that we carry out procurement. But I, I would also add that, that 
as we move forward as a, as a country, as a county on, on this issue, we really have got to make sure that um, it's not just uh, us taking responsibility for our emissions and then say uh, trying to take responsibilities for everyone else. Everyone's going to have to take individual responsibility um, to for, for their own emissions um, in, in the end. So yes, certainly as a council, we'll do everything we can to assist with that process th through any tool that we have. But equally, we've got to work really hard with people to make sure they understand what they need to do to achieve uh, zero carbon um, and, and, and achieve that themselves as well. Thank you, Richard. Um, and the next question is for Nick. Um, is this just a PR exercise that will have no real impact in practice? How do you intend to ensure that it is not? No, is the simple answer to that one. Look, it is certainly not a PR exercise. Uh, and quite frankly, I have plenty of other things um, I could be doing um, than, than fronting PR exercises. No, it certainly isn't. Um, we're committed to this agenda and to reducing carbon emissions. And I think our track record um, does speak for itself. Um, we've reduced our own carbon footprint by more, more than 80% since 2014-15 and are on track for more reductions um, through the major investment programme um, that we've got going. Um, we've, we've invested £88 million of capital and £3.9 million of revenue um, so far um, and, and, and we publish these um, figures and our progress online um, every six months uh, and actually report to cabinet and full council. So. Um, the last one was in July, if people want to go and have a look at it. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it certainly is not a PR exercise. Thank you, Nick. Um, the next question is for Tamara. Um, where can the public access existing strategies mentioned in the climate strategy? For example, Wiltshire Council's electric vehicle charging infrastructure strategy. Thanks, David. So all adopted strategies are published on our website. Uh, the Electric Vehicle Charging Infrastructure Plan is the first implementation plan associated with the climate strategy. It isn't yet adopted, but will be published for consideration by Cabinet later this year. We will also include links to relevant strategies as they are published on our climate web pages. Thank you very much. Um, so the next one is for Richard. Um, the council has a number of buildings that will be able to support the installation of solar panels. What is the council proposing to do to take advantage of generating its own electricity? Thanks. Uh, we're already doing a great deal. Um, as, as Nick just said, we've already reduced our own emissions by 80 percent. Um, and part of that is using our own estate to generate energy. Um, we, we've recently accessed uh, 4.6 million of um, Salix funding, decarbonising heating, installing solar panels on 19 of our buildings. Uh, that's part way, uh, part way through at the moment. And we're next. We're now starting to look at the sort of next stages um, of that program. But I think also more broadly, um, we have we've not been able to make use of it yet, particularly with the, the pandemic um, getting causing causing significant disruption to, to plans we had. But we created an energy company arm to Stone Circle, which is, is our housing company to enable us. Um, the, the national law says that if you're as a council, we're going to generate and then sell energy. We've got to do it through a company. We can't do it directly. So we've we've set that up. Um, it's there to use and we've, we've done some initial work, although not completed any of it yet, looking at some potential sites that we own, particularly sites like park and ride sites where we could put canopies above car parking areas to generate um, energy there that may have additional benefits with EV charging, but not just EV charging. But I do think and um, you'll hear uh, people who are informed when they talk about um, the, the, the challenges we place will, will, will constantly point out how complicated the issue of carbon reduction is. And when you look at the, the Southwest, um, grid capacity is a significant limiting step. It's being worked on. Uh, but it means that there are there is a limit to the areas where you can generate significant um, energy and then feed it back into the grid at the moment. So there are challenges to overcome in that process as well. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, and the next question is for Nick. Um, why are, are, is the council taking so long to decide on solar farms? 
Um, well, let me let me set the scene and, and give some background um, to this. Um, there are figures now available on the BIS website, uh, which shows that Wiltshire um, has installed um, uh, in planning um, or, or, or simply proposed um, the largest capacity of any planning area in the UK uh, of solar. Um, something like over 1200 megawatts. Um, there are only four other counties that are anywhere close um, to this, all large counties, um, which, uh, you know, like Kent uh, um, uh, and so forth. Um, so, you know, we are, we, we've had, you know, got a lot of solar a a applications and a lot of solar um, proposals that are being worked on. Um, they're generally um, significant in size, Many of them are just under the threshold um, to be decided nationally of, of uh, 50 megawatts. Um, and I, I speak firsthand because there's one in my in my division um, that's currently being considered. Um, they're very complex and there's many considerations um, uh, to, to, to be made, um, which take a considerable amount of time, um, you know, particularly on the landscape side, for instance, um, and particularly if uh, changes need to be made to the plans as they go along. Um, quite a lot of parish councils, um, some are supportive, but some have raised objections, as have residents um, uh, to the large, the large scale ones. Um, as part of the local plan review, um, Cabin agree that further work will be undertaken on key parts of the evidence base uh, for the plan, including um, a Wiltshire wide assessment of uh, renewable energy. Um, we're commissioning independent consultants to um, assist us with this and inform the local plan and help us consider how existing policies need to be um, uh, added to or, or, or indeed changed. Um, so in the meantime, we will con we will continue to consider the applications carefully. They will, I'm afraid, take um, some time. Um, I, I, we're obliged to, to consider all aspects um, by law uh, and assess them against the current um, development plan that's in place. Thank you, Nick. Um, and the next question is for Tamara. Um, so what is the key objective of this survey and consultation? What does the council actually want to know? Why is the word count limited in the survey? And what further method methods are available for the public to input their priorities on climate change that they feel to be included in the strategy? Thanks, David. So through this consultation, we want to find out whether there was broad support for our ambition and priorities. We can't tackle climate change alone and we need support from residents, partners and businesses. This consultation aims to find out if there are priorities that have more or less support or whether there is anything we have missed. The total word count for comments we hope is ample and helps to ensure responses are kept to the point. The climate team will be analysing all feedback, so the survey has been designed to capture a broad range of views while enabling that analysis to be completed easily, giving the team more focus uh, for delivery. Thanks, Tamara. Um, so the next one is for Nick. Um, the climate strategy lacks actual policies and strong commitment. Please can you give more specifics to indicate the urgency? Um, well, I, I, if I had, have, if you would have heard this, if I'd been able to say what I was planning to say in my introduction, which uh, uh, didn't go out, um, I was going to stress that this is, of course, a strategy. Um, it's a framework document uh, that sets a clear direction um, for the council and clarifies the areas of focus um, for the next five years. Um, and specific areas of focus for immediate action are highlighted throughout the document with a large exclamation mark. Our regular progress for updates to Cabinet and Council um, show that action's already been taken um, and we're not waiting for this strategy to be adopted to take um, more action. Um, but as aspects of this strategy start to uh, play out, then of course we'll be reporting on those as well. Um, so I think, you know, we've shown significant momentum in this process um, and, and, and that is because of the urgency that there necessarily is. Thank you very much, Nick. So um, the next question is for Richard. 
how can we put more regulation into sustainable house building? And can Wiltshire Council immediately require new homes to be built to higher energy standards or zero carbon? Thanks. Um, sadly, the, the simple answer, particularly to the last part of that question right now, is we can't. I was giving evidence to the Environment Select Committee at Westminster yesterday um, and to to give a, a, a pretty simple quote uh, response there, it, I, I made the point that it is an absolute absurdity right now that we are seeing significant house building going on across the country and in Wiltshire that is being built to a standard that will mean it will need to be retrofitted by 10 years of being built in order to achieve something close to, to um, a, a, a zero carbon standard. That is an absolute absurdity. But the only way that can be changed right now is in Westminster. Uh, it's through a change to either building regulations or a change that could be brought in inside the Planning Act. Um, that change from everything I can see is on the way. Westminster can move relatively slowly comparatively at times. The council can move slowly at times. I think I think government moves slowly at times, um, but that change is coming. Um, if we as a council arbitrarily tried to do that now, um, a planning inspector would simply throw it out. Um, and, and we've seen other authorities that have tried to make headway and, and, and tried to make significant changes. And I think perhaps the, to give the starkest view of, of the difficulty of taking into account of any form of carbon in planning right now, um, East, uh, East Devon Council uh, refused an application for a new power station on the grounds, uh, a non-renewable power station, on the grounds of, of the, the carbon impact and an inspector threw it out at appeal with some pretty firm statements that this simply didn't comply with planning policy. So would I like to do that right now? Absolutely. I, I, we, our council house, all our new council house buildings being built to zero carbon, all the housing that we have control over, we are retrofitting, we are reducing the emissions, we're doing everything we can. But um, we have got to do the, uh, make any changes to to the the core strategy to planning policy in a way that will get past an inspector and comply with national national policy. Um, I am expecting when we put our our local plan update in that it will have some very significant policies here. I am expecting government to have caught up by that point and for us to be able to achieve that through the new local plan update. But I'm afraid right now I wish the answer is yes, but it's not. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, so the next question is for Nick. Um, is Wiltshire Council now fully seized of the existence of the Wiltshire and Barks Canal Trust and the Council's role in the WSO Canal Partnership? Hmm, seized? I, I'm, I'm not sure quite whether seized would be the uh, uh, the word I, I would use, but we do recognise um, the crucial part that canals um, uh, already have and, and increasingly will um, play as a part of the green and blue infrastructure of Wiltshire. Um, these are already supported in our planning policies, I have to say. Um, uh, core policy 52, which covers green infrastructure, as well as core policy 53 canals. Um, so, so they are already there. Um, and the green and blue infrastructure strategy, um, our, na our natural environment plan, as, as, as we've termed it, is a high level framework document. Um, and a series of gradually more detailed plans um, will follow on from it. Uh, and these plans will include the local nature recovery strategy and the settlements framework um, that, that will set out how Cotswolds, Kennet Navon, Wilson, Barks canals will support wider enhancements um, uh, to, to, to the biodiversity um, as well as the green economy, tourism um, and leisure across Wiltshire. Thank you, Nick. Um, and the next question is for Tamara. Um, why isn't the role of rail travel given more emphasis in the transport strategy? Where are the plans for reopening stations to reduce the distance uh, to existing ones? Thanks, David. The objectives relating to public transport are mainly focused on the potential of bus services, as obviously these are more deliverable. That said, 
we have submitted uh, bids to build stations in Devizes, Wilton and Caution uh, to the Department for Transport under the Restoring Your Railway programme um, and we very much hope they will be successful. Uh, they, you know, there is a lot of work to do to to bring those forward, uh, but they they are strong business cases, um, we believe, and uh, we are very much working to do that. Thank you very much. Um, and another question about the blue green infrastructure for Nick. Um, are are there continuous blue green sites along the Bristol Avon, and how much? And how? Sorry. I'll start that one again. Are there continuous blue green sites along the Bristol Avon and how much protection do these valleys have from development? Uh, the, the answer is our green and blue infrastructure strategy um, does recognise the importance of all the river corridors and catchments in Wiltshire uh, as the basis of much of our most distinct and, uh, and diverse habitat. However, the, uh, you know, the strategy is not about stopping development. Um, but it's about ensuring that it is well designed and placed uh, and so that it supports the goals, um, all, th all three of the goals um, of supporting the health and well-being of our communities, um, adapt adaptation and mitigation uh, of, of climate change, uh, impact of, uh, effects of climate change and um, assisting in um, the improvement of biodiversity. Um, so, so there are quite you know, there are yardsticks by which development will be judged um, or potential development will be judged. It's not about completely stopping off all development. Thank you very much, Nick. And now we're going to um, take a question that we've received this evening. Um, this one I'm going to ask tomorrow to answer this one. Um, is Wiltshire Council going to fund bike lanes for the increase in cyclists or are you going to give road space just to cars and how will that impact net zero plans and climate goals? So supporting active travel, cycling and walking is um, a, a very important part of the strategy. Um, one of our areas of focus um, designated by an exclamation mark in the strategy uh, documents um, are to produce uh, local cycling, cycling and walking plans for the county as a whole and also for the three major settlements of um, Salisbury, Chippenham and Trowbridge. Uh, but very much we do recognise the opportunities for local cycling and I can certainly say that um, in Devizes where I'm a councillor we are working to bring forward um, some improved cycling um, infrastructure and other community-based projects. I'm working very closely with um, cycle-friendly devices um, and uh, we're very much looking forward to uh, making it much easier to connect um, from the villages in the wider devices community area into, into devices itself. And obviously, you know, the technology um, and opportunity that um, electric bicycles are bringing bring about is, is significant and uh, and you know we, we we hope and understand that 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 will make cycling more accessible to people even in our geography. Thank you very much Tamara. Um, the next one is for Richard. How does building a bypass in Salisbury contribute to tackling the climate crisis? Yes, thank you. Um, I think there are, uh, uh, oh, it's a broader issue. It's not just a bypass in Salisbury, it's a bypass in Melksham or, or any other road. But I think it is really important that we don't get stuck in a, uh, a, a, a an urban London centric approach to how we tackle decarbonisation of transport in Wiltshire. And we tackle it in a way that addresses Wiltshire's problems and Wiltshire's economic uh, vitality as well. Um, if we, through addressing climate change, were to follow everything coming out of London and try and apply it, um, we'd get nowhere very fast. We'd wind an awful lot of people up and we would actually do very little for the functioning of, of, of Wiltshire in a zero carbon way. We've got to be realistic. We are an urban, uh, we're a rural authority. More than 50 percent of um, our, our, our population, pretty much exactly 50 percent of our population still live in villages. By government definition, 75 percent of our population live in rural areas. And to think that with those small villages and the connectivity required, that cars aren't going to be part 
of, of our means of getting around for a long, long, long time to come, I think would be very foolish. There's certainly no evidence that I've seen to suggest that that can be achieved. And there's no evidence if you look at car use in rural Holland, for example, to suggest that that's um, any, any lower. So it, when uh, transport, when, when vehicles do decarbonize, whether that be electric or hydrogen, and there is still quite an argument going on about the best way of doing that, and, and we're back to grid capacity questions, there will still be cars out there. They won't be emitting, but there will be cars. And then at that point, we need to make sure that we have the infrastructure that enables our economy to function. And when you look at areas like Melksham or Salisbury on the A36, which is a huge pinch point, um, every time I drive in on a Friday, the, the queues start earlier and earlier. Um, I'm, I'm starting to think I need to leave home at 6.30 on a Friday morning and base myself somewhere in Salisbury to avoid them. Um, th those are issues that have a significant impact on our, our town centres, our city centre, um, and on the economy of Wiltshire. So we've got to find a way to enable people to, to go about their daily lives, to, to go about the generate the economy that we we need to keep Wiltshire the nice, happy, prosperous place it is, but to make it zero carbon at the same time. It's not neither or, it's, a, it's an in combination. We've got to bring people with us on this journey, not dictate to them, because if we dictate to them, we're going to get their backs up and we're going to end up going nowhere. Thank you very much for that, Richard. And, and the final um, verbal question this evening, um, again for Richard, um, this one, how can Wiltshire Council set a target date when so much is out of their hands? That is a really good question. Um, for as far as the council itself goes, to make the council carbon neutral by 2030 as a corporate entity, we are confident we can do that. We're 80% of the way there. Um, there are going to be some challenges and challenging elements, but but we know the direction of travel and we know how to achieve it. When we look at the county as a whole, and, and I've been honest about this and said this many, many times before, I do not see any way that we could make Wiltshire Council area, Wiltshire the county, carbon neutral by 2030. Uh, just to give two very simple reasons. Firstly, um, vehicular transport, there will still be polluting cars on the road then. Um, even if they, they whenever they stop being sold, there will still be a period of time when um, diesel and, and petrol cars are still running on the roads and there is no way of taking them off um, and therefore there will be emissions coming from there. But then when you look at housing, retrofitting, if we're going to retrofit, what is it, 200,000 houses in, in Wiltshire um, and if we're going to try and do that in 10 years, that's 20,000 a year. Well, right now, uh, from a council housing point of view, we are struggling to get the first 100 done because we've got to grow that industry. And as we grow that industry and get other people to join in and grow that industry, it's going to take time to scale up. Um, I, I've talked to an awful lot of people in my role locally and nationally, and I know of no expert who believes that we can retrofit housing in this country inside the next 15 years. They think 15 might, with an immense effort, be just about achievable. And more realistically, you're looking at 15, 20 years to achieve that scale of retrofit. So we've got to be honest, we can't make Wiltshire the place carbon neutral by 2030, but we can get the policies in place, the strategy in place, and then as government provides the assistance, the schemes in place, we can build the skills base and the job space to deliver on that so that we are well on the way by 2030 and that we can get there as soon as we can afterwards. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, so that concludes the questions this evening. Um, if we haven't answered your question, um, we will provide written answers and publish them on our website. Um, once again, we apologise for the technical issues we've had this evening and the issues in getting Claire to join the event. Um, we'll ask Claire to record a video that we'll add to our YouTube channel as soon as we can. Um, so I'm now going to pass you over to Tamara, who will talk about the next steps. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, this is a really important um, step for Wiltshire Council and for Wiltshire, um, and I want to encourage you all to continue to engage with us all on this. We are committed to com combating climate change in Wiltshire, but we need your support. Support. So please tell your friends, neighbours and colleagues about the draft strategies and the ongoing consultation, and please share um, content on social media, etc. Please take the time to read the draft climate strategy and our natural environment plan. They are on our website. And most importantly, please complete our online questionnaires to let us know your views. We've posted the, the links to them in the chat. Can one of my colleagues please confirm that we actually have done that? 
Um, and don't forget that we're also holding two webinars where our officers will talk through the two strategies and take your questions on the 15th and 30th of September. So please do sign up for these and spread the word. Thank you very much. I now hand you back to Richard to conclude this webinar this evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tamara. Uh, thank you to, to Nick um, and thank you for, for taking time out to join us this evening. I hope you found the launch event informative. Um, there are, are big challenges ahead, but we can achieve huge things. We can completely transform um, the sustainability of our county through this process. On the way, we've got to be realistic, we've got to be honest, and we've got to create plans that are going to to deliver that that step change, that that paradigm shift in our lives. Uh, but we've got to make sure we put plans in place that work. Uh, part of that is is this consultation, and part of that is getting the feedback and the ideas from all of you. If you want to gain a better understanding of our climate strategy and our natural environment plan, please join us at one of our webinars on the 15th or 30th of September, where we'll be taking you through the two documents and taking more questions. Alternatively, you can watch a recorded presentation on our website. Please don't forget to complete the online surveys to let us know your views. There's a separate survey for each of the two strategies and they're available on our website. Thank you and have a good evening.